just want to let you know, I could preach about five or six different sermons from that particular clip. I could tell you how much I love it when God laughs at Evan's plans. Of course, I love it when God laughs at Evan's plans. I'm not such a big fan when God laughs at my, thing, my plans. We could talk about the one act of random kindness. Hold that thought. We may get to that in a few weeks. We might actually begin to talk about how Evan finally begins to accept his mission. But what I want to focus on is that, that one little statement that God makes. You want to change the world, but you don't know how to start. You don't know where to begin. I mean, there's just so much out there, and there are just so many problems in the world, and there's just all of this stuff. That, where do you begin? I mean, it's, it's such an awesome, overwhelming thought that God wants us to impact the world. How do we even start that? Where's the beginning point? We are studying the book of Nehemiah for the first, basically, first quarter of this particular year. And last, well, actually, I got ready to say last week, two weeks ago, because the snow gave us an eruption, I kind of jumped in the middle of the story. I didn't give you a lot of backstory about this Nehemiah character. I did tell you that, that when we started the story that Israel is in captivity. What I didn't tell you is that Nehemiah is the middle part of a trilogy. If, if you want to understand Nehemiah, you really have to go and you have to read all three parts of the story because this story actually started in Ezra. And then it goes to Nehemiah, and then the third part of the sequel is in, in, in the three part, not the sequel, the third, third part of the trilogy is in Esther, and you combine all three of those books together, and that is kind of the story of Israel's restoration back into the territory. And by the way, no, we're not reading through Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther in one day. I'd like to get to the soup at some point. But last week, we, two weeks ago, I will continue to correct myself there. Two weeks ago, we met Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is not a, quote, master builder. He's not a carpenter. He's not a cement layer. He's not even a manager. He's a food taster. And he's not tasting for the quality of the food. He's simply the guy that got picked and said, we don't want our king to get poisoned, so anything the king eats, you have to taste first. And if you don't drop dead, then we'll assume there's no poison in it. So basically, Nehemiah is nothing more than a guinea pig. And this is who is now going to lead this charge into trying to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And so we looked last week at number at the, the first chapter and how Nehemiah began his mission with prayer. And well, this week we're going to be in, Jer in Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to go verses 1 through 20. If you have your copy of God's Word, you can turn to Nehemiah. We'll have the scriptures on the screen as well, but you can turn. If you don't have a copy of God's Word and you want to follow along, you can use the one in the pew rack right there in front of you. But specifically, what we're going to look at today is nine actions of Nehemiah. Now you know there's nine, so you also know that we're going to move at a pretty good clip here today. So if you're filling in the blanks, I hope you can write quickly because we are going to do nine things that Nehemiah did to prepare for rebuilding the wall. And we're going to start right in verse one, verses 1 through 3. It says, In the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Anaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king, and I had not been sad in his presence before. And the first thing that Nehemiah did, he had to do some waiting. Now you're reading that scripture and say, I don't see any waiting. Well, you have to realize he gives us the month. This is the month of, of Nisan. And he got his report in the month of Kislev, and there's about three to five months, depending on how you want to do the arithmetic for the Jewish calendar. So there's about three to five months between when Nehemiah got his report and now when he is now standing in front of the king. Three to nine months. Three to five months. What was Nehemiah doing for those three to five months? Well, I just want to let you know something. Waiting does not mean that you do nothing. Nehemiah was not sitting around sulking. He wasn't twiddling his thumbs. Nehemiah was waiting, but while Nehemiah was waiting, we already knew that Nehemiah was praying. We read all about that when we went through chapter 1. Nehemiah was praying, and he was fasting, and he was, more, he was capturing his vision through prayer. We're going to find out as we look at this chapter today that Nehemiah was planning, 
Nehemiah was putting together a blueprint for how he was going to go about putting this back together. And Nehemiah was doing some preparing. It wasn't enough just that he had, he had cloaked it in prayer. It wasn't enough that he came up with a good plan. Nehemiah actually had done some groundwork preparation so that he, when, when he went before the king, Nehemiah knew exactly what he had to do. In the early parts of our marriage, my wife and I embarked on the mission that we swore we would never do again. We built a house. Um, and I want to tell you something. That was a, a stressful time. Because you go out and you pick out the land and you're looking at the land and, and you decide you're going to build your house there. And I don't know whether you know this or not. Then you go by the land every so often you look and nothing's happening. The land is just sitting there. And I'm like, where's the wood? Where are the people working? How come they're not cutting down the trees? You have to understand this process of waiting. Something was going on. They were out getting building permits, and they were drawing blueprints, and they were doing perk testing, and they were making sure they put the house in the right place. All of this stuff had to be done. So, so we need to realize that sometimes when God gives us a plan, when God gives us a vision, there is going to be this period of waiting that we have to do, but waiting doesn't mean that we do nothing. It means that we have to prepare our hearts and our minds to move forward. Verses 2 through 3, Nehemiah had to do some trusting. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This cannot, be, this cannot be nothing but sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire? I want you to see that all of Nehemiah's planning, all of his preparing, it didn't remove his fear. See, a lot of times when we're going through what God wants us to do, we get afraid and we're waiting for God to remove all of the fear before I take the next step. Nehemiah was still afraid. <clears throat> Nehemiah still had some difficulty. I mean, after all, the king could have not taken this request very well. It could have gone very badly. He could have just said no, told Nehemiah, get over it. I'm not letting you go anywhere. He could have put Nehemiah to death. I mean, this was a king. He didn't have to go to Congress and ask for permission. This guy could have said, fine, you want to go off somewhere else and build something and leave us? And I'll, I'll just have you executed. This could have gone very badly. But Nehemiah trusted his vision. Nehemiah had gotten this report, and Nehemiah trusted that God had called him to rebuild this wall. And so Nehemiah stated it boldly. He went to the king. He meant no words. He says, I am definitely sad because the city where my ancestors are, it's in ruins. The wall was torn down. The people there are in trouble. Yes, this impacts me greatly. And so after Nehemiah did some trusting, well, <clears throat> Nehemiah did some more praying. Now, keep in mind, he had already been praying for three to five months. You'd think Nehemiah was all prayed up at this point. And I want to stop just a moment before we actually read the verse. And I want you to pay attention to this. Because a lot of times when we embark on a mission or we embark on a vision that God has given us, we pray a lot at the front. And after we think we're all prayed up, we get to moving and we get to marching and we get to doing. And you know what we stop doing? Praying. As we go through the book of Nehemiah, you're going to see Nehemiah keeps coming back and keeps coming back and keeps coming back. He keeps praying. He keeps praying. In verse 4, the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to God in heaven. Now I got a feeling Nehemiah didn't sit down and make some big long prayer. This is probably something pretty simple. The king asked what you want. It was a great question. Nehemiah stated the issue. And now the king wants to know what Nehemiah intends to do about the issue. He was just asking God. Make sure of what I'm doing. Before he answered, he prayed. It was a simple question. Nehemiah already had his plan. Why pray about it? Well, Nehemiah's prayer makes sure that the answer to the question is not what I want. It's what God wants. Nehemiah wants to make sure that everything that he's doing it has nothing to do with what I want. I want to make sure I am doing what God wants wants. Maybe his prayer was simple. Something like give me strength. Maybe it was soften the, his heart. Maybe it is, Lord, this is all for you. 
I don't know what the words are. It doesn't tell us what he prayed. But it is important that as he is standing there in front of the king, he doesn't forget. This is God's mission, not mine. I'm going to do this God's way. And so then, as we begin to continue down, Nehemiah goes from waiting and trusting and praying to seeking. This is what it said. And I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time aside, and I also said to him, If it pleases the king, might I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have the letter to ask for the, to keep the royal part, so he will give me the timber to make the beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, and for the city of the wall and the residence I will occupy. And because of his gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. Nehemiah did a lot of seeking before he began to go out on his mission. Interesting enough, he um, <coughs> sought the blessings of the powers that be. He went out there and he, he took it to the king. Nehemiah didn't go off on some rogue mission, alluding to the movie that just came out. He didn't go out and make his own plan. He didn't go out and just say, I'm going to do this my way. He actually went to the king and said, you know what? I believe this is what God wants me to do. And I'm going to ask you to give me your blessing. He said, a timetable. Isn't that interesting? He put a clock on it. He didn't come back and say, well, this is going to be an indefinite mission, and, you know, we're going to throw a few beams up this day, and we'll see how it goes, and maybe the next day we'll put a few rocks in place. And, and you know, he had a timetable. He had thought through what had to be done. He, he, had a, he had a plan. He sought safe travel. It's interesting. We, we pray a lot when we're going to travel. We want God to, to give us his blessing. We don't want planes to crash, trains to come off the track, boats to sink, or cars to go in ditches. We want safe travel. And Nehemiah prayed for the same thing, and he sought the same thing. He just said, hey, can you send people with me? This is going to be a dangerous mission, so I want to be safe. He sought supplies. Nehemiah was no fool. He knew you couldn't build a wall out of thin air. He said, hey, look, will you go ahead and give me the letter so that when I get there, I don't have to convince somebody to give me the wood. King, if you hand me the letter and I hand them the letter, they got to give me the wood because you're the ruler of all of this stuff. And so I, I just want you to go ahead and pave the way for me. His plan was well thought out. Do you see that? See, Nehemiah had a vision. And he had a mission that he thought was from God. And it was a well-thought-out plan that he was going to take and execute because he realized God is not the author of chaos. God wanted Nehemiah to do this, and he wanted to do this in such a way that it would bring honor and glory to his name. And in the end, he gave God the credit for his success. Now, the next step is the, probably the hardest step. I mean, the waiting is hard for me. I want to be honest with you, I'm not a good waiter. I'm not. I stink at this mode. Okay, I can do the trusting, but I'm, I'm not a great truster. And, and I can seek. I, I don't have problems for asking. But this next step is where the rubber hits the road. You see, Nehemiah had to do some going. This is what verses 9 and 10 said. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letter. And the king had also sent, an, sent army officers and cavalry with me when Sambala and Honorite, I didn't name these people, and Tobiah of the Ammonite official heard about this. They were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Nehemiah went. He didn't get the letters and then go find somebody else and say, okay, I've done my part. I'm the manager of this project. Somebody else go out and take the risk. He got the letters because Nehemiah intended to go. That's a key action. If we're going to have a mission for God, Eventually, it requires us to get out of our seat. If we're going to have a mission for God, I hate to tell you this, 99.9% .9 of what God would have you to do, you cannot do by sitting on your rear end. You just can't do it. God wants you to get up and do some going. Praying is good. I suggest it. I recommend it. It is necessary, but it must lead to action. Seeking is good, but if all I ever do is seek, if all I ever do is sit around and talk about plans, if all I ever do is put things on a piece of paper, I don't get anything accomplished. See, 
Nehemiah simply followed the next logical step. He was sure this is what God wanted him to do. He was positive, and now he's going. And he arrives himself in Israel. He arrives himself there in Judah. And I know what you're supposed to do because, hey, I, I, I'm not a very patient person. You're supposed to pick up a hammer, right? Start getting to work. No, not Nehemiah. Nehemiah understood the value of assessing. Listen to verses 11 through 16. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. <clears throat> there were no mounts with me to accept one, the one I was riding on. By night, I went, throughout the valley, I went through the valley gate toward the jackal wall to the dung gate, examined the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved toward the fountain gate and the king's post, but there was not enough room for my mount to go through. So I went up to the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back. And I re-entered through the valley gate, and the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as, a, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. Nehemiah is a smart man. See, Nehemiah arrives, and, I, and he had heard the report. He, he knew what was going on. But when he arrives, he doesn't start barking out orders. Now, he had the right to. He had a vision from God, and he had signed letters from the king, the ruler of the civilized world at this point. Nehemiah could have come in and said, okay, all you people line up. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. Yeah, I know. I just got here, and I don't really understand about the wall, but this is how it's going to go. Nehemiah didn't do that. Nehemiah sat around for three days. You know what he was doing? He was assessing the people. He was having conversations. He was looking at the people in the city. He was finding out what the real problems were, what the plights were, what the difficulties were, and Nehemiah was assessing the people. Then, well, <coughs> smart man, Nehemiah decides to assess the job. He goes at it night so that he doesn't have anybody else's opinion about what's going on, and he begins to walk the wall. He begins to look at the brokenness himself. He begins to look at the fire and the burned gates and how what the situation is really like. He's getting a heart for what he's doing because he's actually looking at the destruction himself. You see, Nehemiah understands. He knew there was a problem. It was going to be a big task. But he still needed to see all of it for himself. I think a lot of times we don't do this. We, the church, go out on our mission and we begin barking out orders about how people are supposed to change their lives and fix this and do this and do it the other way. And we think we're trying to rebuild people and what we're doing is we're really tearing them down because we haven't taken the time. We haven't walked their life. We haven't assessed the issue. We think we know, but we really don't. You see, when you assess, Nehemiah knew he would need the support of the people so he wanted to make sure he had his facts ready. Nehemiah spent time getting to know them, and he spent time getting to know the project. And then Nehemiah did some informing. Now, maybe we're getting to the part that I think I do somewhat well. Nehemiah now has all of his facts. He's got all of his ducks in a row. He's got all of his information. He took some time to get to know the people, and this is what it says in verses 17 through 18. Then I said to them... You see the troubles we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. As I told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. So Nehemiah has got all of his facts, and I want you to see how he approaches the people. We, not you. Nehemiah said, we are in this together. I am not leaving this city until the job is done. It is we. If you die, I die with you. If you fail, I fail with you. If you succeed, I'll succeed with you. Nehemiah did not say it is a you problem. He said it is a we problem. He stated the obvious. 
I bet you nobody in Jerusalem needed somebody to tell them the walls were down. Nobody in Jerusalem probably needed them to tell them the gates had been burned. Nobody in Jerusalem needed any of that information, but Nehemiah just wanted to make sure I can tell you this because I went out and saw it for myself. It's obvious we have a problem. And Nehemiah told them about his conversations with God and King. Now, this is important because now Nehemiah is throwing in a little authority here. He's telling them, I heard the report. I got on my face before God. I prayed. I mourned. I fasted. I wanted to make sure God was picking me for this job. And then not only did God say go, I went to the king. And look, I've got the letters here. We are ready to get started. It's kind of funny when it all came down to it. He told them, not asked them. It's time to build, folks. Nehemiah didn't send out a poll or a survey and said, who wants to rebuild the walls? Nehemiah didn't have a vote. Nehemiah didn't ask if they were all that concerned. Nehemiah knew by the looks on their faces they realized the problem. And Nehemiah simply told them, it's time to start building the walls of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah must have been one great salesman. Because I want you to see verse 18. They, the people, replied, Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Assessing is nice. Assessing can give you great intentions, but if good intentions are all you've got, that's not going to fulfill a mission. At some point, you've got to pick up a hammer. At some point, you've got to get a trawl to put the concrete between the walls. At some point, you've got to remove the rubble that's standing in your way. At some point, you've got to get the people together, and they have to begin to understand there is work that has to be done, and somebody's got to get started. Nothing ever gets fixed by looking at it. Trust me, I know. We have lots of things at my house, and I'm like, man, I wish that would get fixed. I can wish about it all I want, but guess what? It doesn't get fixed unless either I do it, or I pay somebody to do it that knows how to do it because I'm not a very good carpenter or anything. You have to have somebody actually begin to work. Now, you would think that Nehemiah has done so much. Nehemiah's got everybody working. He went and made the plan. He went and put all of this stuff together. It's time for Nehemiah to go and sit down and just kind of marvel at his good work. Not if you're the leader. There is no time out, no rest, and no vacation for the leader. See, Nehemiah had to do some inspiring as we went along. Verses 19 and 20 says, But when Sambala and Harana and Tobiah the Ammonites, uh, the Ammonite official at Geshem and the Arab heard about it, they mocked at us at, and ridiculed us. What is it you were trying to do, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them, saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding but as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim to his historic right. You'll find them in every crowd. People that just can't catch the vision. They'll say good things sometimes, but really in their hearts, they just really can't understand the damage. They'll be unwilling to do anything to help you. But they'll be doing, willing to do much to hinder you. They'll complain. They'll mock, and they'll accuse. You realize what they're trying to do, don't you? They want you to stop. They're not interested in God's mission. They're interested in their own comfort. And Nehemiah gives these people a great response. He focused on God's work. He says, you can complain all you want. The complaint department starts in heaven. You go complain to God. He remembered the fact that he is but a servant. This is not his vision. You see, what Nehemiah knew is he could not fix these, people, these people's misery. These people were miserable before the work started. As we read through the story, these people are going to be miserable all the way through while the work is going on. And guess what? At the end, they're still miserable. See, there are just some people that you just can't do anything with. They're going to mock and complain no matter what you're doing. If you're doing something for God, they're going to try to slow you down. They're going to try to be a speed bump. And we need to realize what, was, what Paul told Timothy. 
But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness and godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you recall when you make when you made when you made your great confession in the presence of many witnesses. You see, for those people that just can't catch the vision, there comes a time and a point when you just have to say, I'm sorry. But I know what God has called us to do. You see, God has called us, Parkview Christian Church, to build. Not a building. This is not a relocation message. At the end, I just want to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to blow the ending now. At the end, there is no big thing that we're going to, we want to move the church. That's not the point of this. We're not talking about building a physical building. But God has called us to build. God has called us to build a vehicle that will go out and reach a lost and dying world that will help people that are struggling in their life whose lives have been torn down like those walls of Jerusalem. They've been burned. They've been, they've been put through the ringer. Their walls have gaps in them, and they are in trouble. And God has called us, Parkview Christian Church, to go out into that kind of a world and say, you know what? We want to help you build your life. But if we're going to do that, we're going to have to remember these nine simple steps. Because every single time we come in contact with a new life, you have to realize we're going to have to go through the same nine steps. We're going to have to wait. We're going to have to trust. We're going to have to seek. We're going to have to assess. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to get everything together. We're going to have to do this every single time. Every single person, you start at square one, and we just can't skip the steps because they're all important. But I want you to begin to see, Nehemiah had a plan. Nehemiah had a process for reaching people, for moving people from a community to a crowd and a crowd to the connected and the connected to the committed to get us ready to go out and reach people. It's time to build, folks. And to do that, we have to have the raw materials to build. And so God wants us involved in people's lives, people that are outside of our fellowship, not so that we can tell them how great we are, but so we can tell them how great God is if you'll just let him help you rebuild your life. Maybe you're here today, and you know what? Your walls are still down. You've never met Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You've never followed him. And I want to tell you something. You're in a great place. Because if you want to come forward when we do our time of decision, we will set you down and have somebody turn the pages of Scripture with you, and we can show you what it means to be a follower of Christ. Maybe you're here today, and, and you've done that part, but you know what? You just kind of let it go. You, you become satisfied with looking at the brokenness all around you, so satisfied with it, you just can't even see it anymore. You can't see the brokenness in people's lives, and so you've turned your back on it, not because you're, you're, you're angry, just because you become desensitized. Let me encourage you to use this time of decision to look at the lives that are touching your life and look at their brokenness and make the, the, the decision that, you know what? God has called me to a mission. God has called me to help rebuild the walls of people's lives. Very simply. Whatever it is you need to do today, I pray that you will do it. And Lord, I just pray that you would just understand what it means to impact people's lives. Would you please stand? And we're going to pray.